So I have been studying and researching Sasquatch for over 40 years. Uh, since the late 70s, uh, my father took me to see a movie in the theaters called The Legend of Sasquatch, <clears throat> and I was hooked. And I've been studying off and on, uh, mostly on, though, for over 40 years. And people that know me know that I am a firm believer that Sasquatch is a real creature. Now, I've never seen Sasquatch, but I'm convinced that he's there. Why? How can I be so convinced? By looking at the evidence. And there is plenty of evidence, if you want to look at it, if you want to see it for what it is. People know this about me, and I've engaged in countless conversations about Sasquatch. And I've often made the bold statement that if you give me five or ten minutes, it usually ends up being a half an hour, that you will no longer doubt the existence of Sasquatch, or at least the possibility that he exists. You may not be a full-blown believer, but you'll at least have to admit that there's the possibility that this creature exists just because of the evidence. It was kind of like, have you ever seen gravity? Well, of course not. You can't see gravity, but if you drop something, you see the effects of gravity. Okay? There's the proof that gravity exists by the effects of gravity. And if you want to go there, you could say the same about God. Have you ever seen God? Well, the Bible says no man can look upon the face of God and live. Nobody's seen God. And that's a whole theological understanding about the glory of God and the fallen nature of man, which is why for our own benefit and protection that we can't, we would be eviscerated by his holiness. But again, this is not about theology, but the point is, how do we know about God then if we've never seen him? Well, how about the evidence? The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Romans that the very Godhead, the nature of God can be known by all the things which are created, simply stated, Creation demands a creator. So, again, this is not a theologic post. It's about Sasquatch. I don't believe Sasquatch to be an alien. Uh, I believe that uh, he is another creation, just like we are. But when talking to someone about Sasquatch, trying to present the evidence, to take them from being a doubter to at least saying, okay, it's possible this creature might exist. I liken it to atheist versus agnostic. See, atheist, well, it comes from the Greek word theos for God, T-H-E-O-S. Put an A in front of it, ah, theos means no God, atheist. But the Greek word for knowledge is gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S. Put an A in front of it, agnosis or agnostic simply means I have no knowledge or no personal knowledge of a thing or of God. And the same could be true of Sasquatch. To say that there is no Sasquatch is like saying there is no God. You can't make that blanket statement unless you know everything about everything. And nobody does. So the most you can be in both cases is an agnostic. In other words, I have no personal knowledge of a thing. And that's where I try and take people when it comes to talking about Sasquatch uh, is just in the evidence to give them some of that knowledge so that they can make an informed decision. Even if it's to go from Sasquatch does not exist to, okay, maybe he does exist. I still don't know. But I'm not at the point where I'm saying absolutely not. There's no way that he could exist. And there is so much evidence when you're looking at uh, Sasquatch for his, his uh, existence. And the first would be, well, the footprints. We'll, we'll talk about that for just a moment. Um, there's a reason he's called Bigfoot. Now, the term Bigfoot uh, came about in, in um, I believe it was 1958. There were some loggers in California who returned to their work site, and they found that their equipment had been strewn about like play toys. But they also found a bunch of big footprints. Newspaper reporter, uh, I have his name written down here, Andrew Genzoli, who worked for the Humboldt Times, 
1958 did a story and then subsequent follow-up stories because the interest was so great. And I think in, in the article he wrote that uh, whatever did this had a Bigfoot. Uh, the name Bigfoot stuck from that point on. But did you know that every single Native American tribe, as I understand it, in their own language, has a name for Bigfoot? Sasquatch is a Native American name for Bigfoot. Uh, and I've seen pictures of uh, totem poles where they have carved uh, real animals like bear, wolf, eagle, and Sasquatch right there with those other animals. Why would they carve real known creatures and then just throw in some imaginary creature, some mythical creature? I submit they would not. You've also seen uh, pictures of a large hairy man in their cape drawings and things like that. Why would they do that? Um, but they did. So when looking at the footprint, that is very, very good evidence that there's something out there. Now, let me say that I approach the study of Sasquatch with Sherlock Holmes in mind. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, who wrote Sherlock Holmes, he had Holmes solve crimes using the following adage. When you eliminate the impossible, that which remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And that is very applicable to a study of Sasquatch, because if you look at the evidence and eliminate the impossible, the things that it can't be, well, what are you left with, even if it's improbable? So looking at footprints, I will make this statement that no serious researcher or informed researcher of Sasquatch is ever, ever fooled by fake prints. Now, I remember, what was it, in the 70s, there was a man and his two sons who claimed to be making these footprints that were fooling all of these people, and they showed pictures of uh, wooden cutouts, and they had the ropes tied to them that could hold up and, and uh, walk around stomping out these fake prints, and they were just fooling everybody. And I would say to you, that's patently ridiculous on its face, unless they're going coast to coast, border to border, doing this for a prank. And then you would have no characteristics in these footprints. It would be the same print stamped foot after foot after foot. No difference, no change. So you're not going to be fooled by that. Let me also say that if you come across a single print or a couple of prints, you're not going to build a case for Sasquatch on that unless... There is something absolutely remarkable about this print or these prints. So what are you looking for in prints? Well, if they're faked, like these guys uh, standing on these little cutouts, uh, platforms that they made, first of all, how deep is the impression into the substrate, in the soil? It's going to be very different if you have a five, six, seven, eight hundred pound animal walking as opposed to a 175, 180, 200 pound man standing on platforms. It's going to sink a lot deeper into the substrate and there are ways they can measure that to determine how heavy the creature is. Not the least of which is to take your own footprint next to this and see how deep you can get your print next to this print. You can tell a lot about how much a creature weighs by how far the footprint sinks into the soil. Also, think about stride. Just because you put these wooden cutouts on your feet, it's not going to increase your stride like would necessarily have to happen for a creature that's 8, 9, 10 feet tall, which we have found. You know, there are several things about footprints that make them unique, and probably the holy grail of footprints are the dermal ridges right, or fingerprints. Now, I remember seeing an interview with Dr. Jimmy Chilcutt. Now, if you've never heard of him, he is an FBI forensics analyst. I believe FBI, but law enforcement forensics analyst. Uh, he made the statement in the interview that I watched that nothing is important to me as is my reputation because my testimony puts people in jail. But what makes Dr. Chilcutt so qualified to examine Sasquatch 
prints is that he is one of the few, very few, latent uh, fingerprint experts who's also an expert in primatology. He's one of the few who's been able to fingerprint the great apes. So he was watching Dr. Jeff Meldrum talk about dermal ridges in a plaster cast that he was showing. And that piqued Dr. Shulcutt's interest because this is his wheelhouse. This is his area of expertise. He contacted Dr. Jeff Meldrum and uh, ended up looking at uh, pretty much all of the plaster cast in Dr. Meldrum's collection. And he determined that some were fakes, some weren't. And I wrote down what Dr. Jill Cutt said. Dermal ridges flowed lengthwise along the foot in these plaster casts. Now in humans, they flow side to side, not lengthwise. He said, no way do human footprints do that. Never, ever. And then he went on. I believe this is an animal in the North Pacific that we have not yet documented. Well, how about that? So he went from being an absolute skeptic to making a statement like that. And I remember in the interview, he said something that kind of was the icing on the cake for him. If you notice that if you get a cut like across your finger, where your dermal ridges or fingerprints come together at that scar, they curl in. And that's exactly what he was seeing in these footprints. So, yeah, he became a believer. Now, he doesn't know what it is, but there's something there. So, going back to our analogy, if you eliminate the impossible, that which remains, however improbable, must be the truth. Look at these footprints. Okay. You've got an average size of a male, as I understand it, is about 17 inches long. Females aren't much farther behind. A broad heel. And something I haven't talked about yet are uh, mid-tarsal breaks. Now, if you think about the human foot, it's a rigid platform and it bends at the toes with an arch, unless it's a fallen arch, which happens. But Sasquatch apparently has something called a mid-tarsal break that allows the foot to flex in the middle of the foot. I remember watching a, a video analysis, and I don't remember if it was M.K. Davis or Thinker Thunker, but one of them showed this mid-tarsal break in action in Patty, the Patterson-Gimlin film. As the foot came forward, you could see the foot bend upwards in the middle. The humans can't do that. Humans do not have a mid-tarsal break. Humans do not have dermal ridges that run lengthwise across the foot. Humans do not have a stride as long as Sasquatch must have. So, if we eliminate the impossible, can't be human, it's not a bear, it's nothing that we know, what's left? Sasquatch? Is it improbable? Well, who's to say? But if we begin putting the pieces of the evidence together, we end up with what's called a preponderance of the evidence. Do you know you can convict of murder without a body using preponderance of the evidence? So let's move on. You got the footprints. Let's talk about vocalizations. There are so many vocalizations that we have. Uh, we can listen to the one that comes to mind, Ron Moorhead, uh, Samurai Chatter, Sierra Sounds. You can subject vocalizations to spectrograph analysis, and you can actually put fingerprints on the vocalizations. You can see the highs and the lows. And these are beyond human range, too high and too low. Now, we know what a bobcat sounds like. We know what a wolf sounds like. We know what a fox, a coyote, a barn owl, a screech owl. We know what these animals sound like. And we can pull out the fingerprint, the spectrograph of these sounds, and we know what they are. And if you take some of these Sasquatch sounds and compare them to known creatures, you walk away going, it's none of those. So what is it? I remember going to a conference once where Ron Moorhead actually spoke. It was an honor. And I remember in that conference, they had linguists that had actually broken down the samurai chatter and declared this is, in fact, a language. Now, how about that? Again, more expert testimony on some evidence of Sasquatch. So you've got footprints that can't be human. You've got vocalizations that can't be human, but 
or any other known animal. How about uh, body proportions, arm and leg lengths? Now, I remember seeing a study once that showed humans have legs that are approximately 20% longer than our arms. On the other end of the spectrum are the great apes, the chimps, uh, the gorillas. Their arms are about 20% longer than their legs. Where does Sasquatch fit? If you watch video of genuine Sasquatch, like the Patterson-Gimlin film, for one, and others that come to mind, the Paul Freeman film, you can actually measure the arms and legs and see that the legs are just a hair longer than their arms, but they're about the same lengthwise. Now, that's not a human. How does a human change his body proportions by putting on a suit? Can't happen. Also, the, what's, uh, I think, thinker thunker called the trailing shin angulation. On the trailing shin, it's almost perpendicular to the ground. Humans, every human, whether it's male, female, doesn't matter the height, have about the same trailing shin angulation. Sasquatch has a much shallower trailing shin angulation. Add that to the body proportions, the gait, the mechanics of the way the creature walks, and it's not human. Humans are not built, not designed to walk like that. Yet here is a creature that's walking like that on two legs. It's not a bear. Certainly a bear can walk on two legs for short periods of time. But their limbs are so much shorter than Sasquatch in proportion to their bodies. And you look at these videos. Paul Freeman, the Independence Day uh uh, Patterson Gimlin. You tell me that's a bear. Then you do the math. Look at the trailing shin angulation, the, the body proportions, the arms and legs. Especially in the Patterson Gimlin film, that some, you know, what was it, 1957. And compare that to, uh, I've seen uh, pictures of Planet of the Apes where they had million dollar budgets for these costumes. There's no comparison. I've seen study of Patterson Gimlin, where they've done uh, enhanced and stabilization and all the tricks that they do with video now, and you can see movement of the muscles under the fur. You can see facial features and blinking of the eyes. It's not a suit. They didn't have suits back then that could do that. And even today, you need something called animatronics, and there's something else. You're never ever fooled by CGI, computer generated images. Uh, I saw, uh, I think it was um, In Search of Bigfoot, which I'm not a big fan of. I think uh, it's more show than it is science. You know, I'm sorry if that offends somebody, but they often, uh, or Monster Quest is another one where they have uh, computer-generated images of Sasquatch. Uh, the New Planet of the Apes, same thing. They have computer-generated images of the apes. But you know what? You can tell just by looking at it, that it's not real. Go back to 1957 and look at that video. Okay. So you have these creatures that walk, not like a human, but it's not a bear. It's not any other animal that we know. So if you've eliminated the impossible, what's left? Improbable, but could it be a Sasquatch? So you've got footprints, you've got vocalizations, you've got um, the uh, body proportions, trailing shin. And, and listen, the list goes on. There's so many things that you can look at when talking about Sasquatch. And begin to put the pieces of the puzzle together. I've never seen a Sasquatch. But when I look at all the evidence, I know he's real. Because I've eliminated the impossible. It's not any known animal. It's not a human so what's left, however improbable, I'm calling Sasquatch. So that's generally when I talk to people who might be doubters, unbelievers, or just skeptics. But I always find they're fascinated and interested to talk about it, at least most of the time. 
I can't even think of a time when someone just didn't even want to talk about it once we got going. It's a fascinating subject, sure is. One of the things that disappoints me in a lot of the conferences is they tend to, to devolve into storytelling. And stories are great. Stories add color. And if you get enough stories together, you can begin to, to paint uh, characteristics and habits of these creatures. But they're not evidence. They're stories. And I think there's so much evidence that can actually be looked at, and the stories add color to, to make a presentation of the evidence not so dry. But listen, folks, the point I want to make to you is that even though I've never seen a Sasquatch, if I look at the evidence, I am absolutely convinced that he is real. And I would just encourage people to study the evidence, you know, the areas that we've talked about and other areas, uh, and uh if just eliminate the impossible. Could it be a human? Nope, can't be a human. Is it some animal that we know? Nope, not animal that we know. What's left? All right, take care. Bye for now.